Can I ask members please to leave the chamber quietly out of respect to the member who is about to lead a debate? The final item of business is a member's business debate on motion number 1541 in the name of Mark Ruskell on action on residential road safety. This debate will be concluded without any questions being put. Would those members who wish to speak in the debate please press the request to speak buttons now? I call on Mark Ruskell to open the date, mis debate. Mr Ruskell, seven minutes, please. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. And can I thank members who have signed my motion to bring about this members' debate tonight? And can I thank in advance those who will make contributions, including the Cabinet Secretary? I'd also like to pay tribute to those many people across Scotland campaigning for road safety improvements, from Toucan crossings to yellow lines, increased space for walking and cycling, and importantly, the reduction in the speed limit from the default 30 to 20 miles an hour. We have also seen strong national campaigning around the issue of parking on pavements and double parking, and I welcome the decisive contribution that Sandra White's Members' Bill made to that debate and the resulting commitment from the Scottish Government. Community councils, parent councils, informal neighbourhood action groups are working hard across Scotland, supported by the work of local authorities and organisations such as Living Streets and Sustrans, in helping to understand the problems and design the right interventions to encourage safer and more livable neighbourhoods for all. And I've been particularly impressed by the work of schools such as Bridge of Allen Primary, whose junior road safety officers have run with the police an active stop and interview programme with speeding drivers at the roadside. An empowering step up from the Tufty Club of the 1970s when children were advised to hold mother's hand when stepping out of the house rather than a speed gun. Now, what all of these groups... Yeah, go on. Yeah. Ms Adamson. Thank Mr Ruskell um, for that intervention. I look forward to taking part in the debate. But you may have to explain to the uh, Minister what the Tufty Club is, because I suspect he might be a little bit young for that one. <laughs> well, I'd be happy Mr. to Ruskell. do that. And there's a, there's a whole range of uh, interesting YouTube videos featuring the Tufty Club, which I've been showing my children. They, they can't really believe it. Um, what all of these groups recognise, of course, is that the reduction of speed where people live is the foundation not only for reducing casual team numbers, but in building confidence for all to walk, push, cycle and scoot. When we consider the most vulnerable in our society, children, those with physical disabilities, those with dementia even, we're creating not just safer neighbourhoods, but fairer places to live by reducing speed. By reducing speed, we're also reducing social isolation by encouraging people to get out and about, to play, to visit, to meet up, and even to shop. I would hope that members in this chamber across all parties would now recognize the large body of evidence that links speed with fatality rates, which at 30 mile an hour is 20%, while at 20 mile an hour is only 3%. Now, Scotland is on track to meet its 2020 targets for a 40% reduction in road fatalities, from the 2004 baseline. And I welcome that, but of course there is no room for complacency, especially when we consider that in the UK, pedestrian cyclists and motorcyclist deaths make up 50% of road fatalities overall, contrasting with only two-fifths of deaths in Sweden. So it's very clear that a particular focus on vulnerable road users is needed in our approach. And it's crystal clear that 20 mile an hour limits work they reduce average speed across a road network of between one to two miles an hour, which may seem unimpressive, but when you consider that for every one mile an hour reduction in speed, there's a concurrent five to six percent reduction in casualties, I hope that we can all agree that 20 mile an hour limits bring a very real impact on real people. Since the 30 mile an hour speed limit was introduced as the urban default in 1934, after a campaign by Living Streets, which at the time was called the Pedestrian Association, the evidence and understanding of road safety has moved on, with living streets today among a growing number of bodies from 20s Plenty to the British Heart Foundation to Brake, who are calling for us to move into the 21st century by dropping to 20 for residential areas. And this reflects a growing recognition that the benefits of reducing speed limits to 20 are multifaceted and extend beyond safety to wider health and environmental benefits. With physical inactivity costing health budgets in the UK nearly £11 billion every single year, we need a step change. And that's why, for example, it was a director of public health, not roads, who made the investment in a 20 mile an hour rollout across Manchester. We also face air quality problems from nitrous oxide and particulate emissions, which studies show are reduced, particularly in diesel cars, when dropping speed. 
While data on direct carbon emissions is inconclusive, the impact of even a slight modal shift to walking and cycling over short journeys makes a valuable contribution to our stumbling progress in reducing transport emissions in Scotland. In fact, where councils like Fife have made significant progress in building a network of popular 20 mile an hour zones, they've seen cycle trips increase by 20%, while Edinburgh has also seen cycle trips increase and also permissions for children to play outside double. The progression from the initial advisory 20s plenty zones in the early noughties to the rollout of 20 mile an hour mandatory zones has been welcome, if not at times a postcode lottery in Scotland. Where these have been introduced and public support is high, with one survey showing 68% support post-introduction. But this piecemeal rollout has come with challenges, complexities and costs which could be addressed by the introduction of a 20 mile an hour default limit in residential areas. Let's take the traffic regulation order process, a time-consuming and costly approach for councils to establish a patchwork of small, discrete 20 mile an hour zones. Zones where the transition from 30 to 20 in residential areas requires signage, speed bumps, which are of course unpopular with drivers. It costs seven and a half times more per mile to regulate with speed bumps than it does with a neighborhood-wide 20 mile an hour limit. And it's also harder for the police to enforce a patchwork of 20 and 30 zones where drivers can claim confusion surrounding the point at which they left one zone and entered another. When I visited Bridge of Island Primary, like most schools, it's in a residential area, but it has its own 20 zone. But these school zones typically only extend a few hundred meters beyond the gates, ignoring the fact that on average children travel nearly two kilometers to school. If we're convinced of the benefits of 20 at the school gate, then why not extend these benefits to the whole route of the average school journey through a neighborhood? It's no wonder that a more universal approach to establishing 20 mile an hour as the default residential limit was unanimously welcomed by council representatives at a recent Scottish conference discussing the best way forward to secure progress. Edinburgh course has begun its citywide rollout, but I think some of Edinburgh's early challenges in rolling out a coherent scheme uh, that's easily understood by road users have been hampered by this piecemeal TRO approach. A far simpler, more elegant approach for councils across Scotland would be to flip 30 mile an hour with 20 as the default limit in residential areas, allowing councils to then exempt key roads through settlements that gen gen genuinely require a higher speed limit of 30 mile an hour. Presiding officer, this Parliament's taken bold steps in the past, such as the smoking ban in public places. If we're convinced of the benefits of 20 mile an hour in residential areas for the safety of our people and the well-being of our places, let's take a similar step and use the powers of this Parliament to make it the default limit for Scotland. Thank you. Now move to the open debate. Would all members make sure they press the request to speak buttons? Speeches of four minutes. Alec Johnson be followed by Claire Adamson. Mr Johnson, please. Thank you very much, Deputy Presiding Officer. I'd like to take the opportunity to congratulate Mark Ruskell on bringing this motion forward uh, and to offer uh, what I would hope he would understand is my conditional support. It is clear that changes that have taken place, particularly the introduction of the 20s plenty zones, have had a significant effect in improving road safety. And that we ha have, as we've moved forward with uh, considering these zones and their application, found ourselves in a position where there is growing pressure for increased areas to be covered by these 20 mile per hour zones. Uh, I have no objection to the use of 20 mile per hour zones uh, in built up areas uh, and of course they have a particular value outside uh, schools and other public buildings, uh, especially where children may be close to the road uh, and at times perhaps not entirely under the control of their parents for the younger ones. It is nevertheless important that we take a clear view on how best to progress this. And it does worry me that on occasion we find ourselves moving forward into a situation where an assumption is made that if it is a good thing to reduce speed, then reducing it further and extending these zones must of course be better. I'm not entirely convinced that that is the case. And I would like to take this opportunity to raise one or two concerns I have. As I pointed out, this is not necessarily in direct opposition to the proposals that Mark Ruskell is uh, bringing forward for discussion tonight. It is nevertheless uh, a situation where I think we need to talk about some of the potential negatives in order to understand better how we progress. The 
What concerns me are key issues such as, for example, drivers approaching areas of danger, danger should be considering their speed as they approach that area of danger. It worries me that the extension of lower speed limits into much larger zones means that drivers will not lower their speed as they approach a particular area, such as a school or another public building. For that reason, I do believe that variable speed limits have a value in continually reminding drivers that they should be travelling at a speed appropriate for the area they're in. La um, but perhaps towards the end, but I, I do have a number of points I want to get through. Large 20 mile per hour zones uh, are less likely to provoke that response from drivers in key areas. It's also important that we deal with issues of observance and enforcement if we bring uh, these greater limits in. By observance, I mean that drivers need to buy in to the measures that we're bringing forward. A speed limit ignored is argu arguably even more dangerous than having no speed limit at all. If drivers are already exceeding the speed limit in a given area, suggesting reducing the speed limit is perhaps a naive response. The other thing I wanted to talk about is enforcement, and appropriate enforcement of speed limits is vital in my view. It must take place in areas of danger, not in areas where the limit is most likely to be exceeded or broken. For example, we all know in rural villages, for example, they are much more likely to catch somebody breaking the speed limit 20 yards before the end of speed limit sign than you are outside the local school. So it's important that when enforcement measures are taken, that these are applied in the areas of danger not in the areas where the greatest number of offences might be committed. Uh, yes, I will at this I'm stage. afraid you're in your last minute. I, and if you are indeed, four minute speeches. <laughs> There's the clock. I look forward to having the opportunity to discuss this at greater length with Mark Ruskell. I congratulate him on bringing this matter forward. Uh, I think it is something that is worthy of discussion, but it's one which I will have my concerns to express. Thank you very much. I'm sure Mr Roscoe looks forward to it. Claire Adamson, followed by Jenny Mara. Ms Adams. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. And my apologies if I have to leave before uh, six o'clock this evening if the debate hasn't finished at that time. Um, uh, can I too congratulate Ms. Mark Ruskell in bringing this um, debate to the Parliament today as the convener of the Cross-Party Group on Accident Prevention and Safety Awareness and um, well aware of a number of the research areas in which he discussed today about um, the appropriateness of 20 mile an hour um, safety zones. And we do have um, a lot of tools in the bag that we could be drawing on to improve road safety. Um, parking issues already mentioned. There's also the opportunities from graduated licences and the smart box technology, which gives advice back to, to young drivers and to drivers, uh, commercial drivers, about the appropriateness of their driving um, over the course of their, their working day and actually target them with um, less um, aggressive driving techniques. Of course, um, I was listening to Mr Johnson um, and I suppose the, the one thing I would say to him is for me it's not so much the drivers that are over the limit, of course that's a huge issue, but really the research that shows what the difference um, can be in terms of the significant of injury of risk and the damage to cars at different speed. Um, the most recent um, statistics provided by Rossba on this show that um, a, a, a fatality risk at 20 miles an hour is 1.5 per cent, but at a speed limit of 30 is it 8 per cent. And I find that quite a staggering statistic that it's so much more dangerous for a pedestrian to be stuck at 30 miles an hour than it is for someone at 20 miles an hour. Um, as someone who comes from North Lanarkshire, I know that North Lanarkshire Council were one of the first councils in the country to introduce the 20 mile an hour speed limits on domestic roads, um, uh, on residential roads, as well as around our primary schools. And the statistics from that, from that council alone show what a great impact that reduction had on the number of fatalities and injuries to people in the North Lanarkshire area. It was, of course, in 2001 that the Scottish Executive issued the um, circular, which allowed guidance for mandatory and advisory 20 mile an hour routes in our areas and since that time we have seen um, improvements in road safety in that area. In fact, um, my colleague 
Bruce Crawford, uh, I believe, received a, um, an award for his efforts in uh, getting Stirling Council to introduce the 20s Plenty um, road advice in their residential streets as well. So we have come a long way. This is, of course, not a unique problem for Scotland, and I would draw um, people's attention to the European Day Without a Road Death, which was um, it's called Project Edward, which was... Um, introduced across the European Union um, really to, to challenge driver behaviour and get people to look at the consequences of their behaviour and how that might needlessly be causing devastating accidents. Presiding officer, as someone who lost my niece um, crossing the road as a teenager um, about eight years ago, I find, you know, when we talk about these statistics, we have to get to the very bottom of, of what this is, and it is about real-life tragedy for families. And I would mention young Lennon Toland, five-year-old boy who lost his life on the 11th of September, um, walking home from school in an area where there were parked cars and where there was a, a, an access across the pavement to, to a car park. Of course, the circumstances of that will become clear in time. But every one of these incidents is a complete tragedy for the family. And we can't ever, um, although it's inconvenient for drivers and all the rest of it, I think the, the safety of pedestrians, particularly our children, has to be paramount as we look at these issues. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, call Jenny Mara to be followed by Gordon Lindhurst. Ms Mara, please. Uh, thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Can I start uh, this evening by commending Mark Ruskell for bringing this um, important debate uh, to Parliament. I would like to uh, speak on behalf of my uh, constituents tonight, a group of whom have been campaigning for a 20 uh, mile per hour limit on one of their streets in the city of Dundee. I, the Minister will be aware of this case as I have written to him about it and he has replied, but I wanted to uh, use this opportunity to talk through um, a few of these issues. The nub of which, I think, is really to try and seek clarity from government on the strength and implementation of this guidance, because I know from uh, the Minister's letter that he's very keen on balancing this 20 mile per hour um, policy with also the discretion of local authorities. But I think there's actually quite a, um, a unique case here, because the street I'm talking about is a street I'm very familiar with, because it was um, a street I used to access as uh, a pupil going to my high school, St John's High School. But Johnson Avenue, the street I'm talking about, was not only access to my high school, it is now access to an additional primary school, Kings Park, and Kings Park Secondary School as well. And I wonder, I might be wrong about this, but I wonder if perhaps it is the only solely residential street in Scotland that has access to a primary school and two secondary schools and the amount of pupils that that involves. But residents on that street have been told continually by Dundee City Council that it cannot be a 20 mile per hour limit uh, because it is a, a road of strategic importance. Um, I welcome uh, Dundee City Council's consultation that they've been doing a thorough consultation on the 20 mile per hour limit across the city and they have identified areas of particularly residential areas uh, where they want to move to the 20 mile per hour limit particularly welcome in communities like Ardler where a girl was thrown in the air just earlier this summer uh, by a car as she was getting ice cream from a van on uh, a Saturday evening but I think I think if the government is serious about this policy and making sure, and the, I would like to refer to, to the Minister's letter here, because he does say that the guide aims to, aims to ensure greater consistency on setting 20 mile an hour street speed restrictions throughout Scotland and encourages local authorities to introduce them near schools in residential zones. I would argue that the street I'm talking about 
is a purely residential zone. It is quite unique in having access to two secondary schools, one primary school. I have invited the Minister to come to Dundee. I know he said he would meet with the residents of Johnson Avenue if time in his diary permits. Um, I'd like to extend that invitation again. The evidence on uh, this road, presiding officer, is really quite uh, breathtaking. There's often speeding over 40 miles per hour. It's used as a through road for council vehicles and for buses. And for the residents of that road, I think something really should uh, be done. If I can make one further observation, presiding officer. This please, may make be, it, please make it briefly. I will. Uh, this, I do have four minutes, yes. This may be a purely observation on my part, and I wonder if the Minister has any evidence on this, but from the driving I do uh, around Scotland, I have noticed that I think 20 mile per hour um, areas seem to be in more affluent parts of our community, and I wonder if the residents there are more successful at making their voices heard and imposing uh, stricter speed limits. I'd be interested in any evidence that the Scottish Government might have on that. Thank you. Thank you very much. I uh, call Gordon Lindhurst to be followed by Alison Johnson and Ms Johnson will be the last speaker in the open debate. Mr Lindhurst. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. May I thank my colleague Mark Ruskell for bringing this important issue of residential road safety to the Parliament. Uh, elements of this debate have been hotly contested, as I'm sure everyone is aware, and no more so than in Edinburgh over the last couple of years. But let me first of all acknowledge the positive and welcome trend highlighted by Mark Ruskell's motion that recognises the significant drop in casualties on Scotland's roads over the last decade. Uh, as has already been said, these numbers continue to improve. Fatalities and casualties show a steady drop amongst children, in particular, which is welcome news. But as long as deaths and injuries continue to happen on Scottish roads, we, of course, cannot be satisfied with the way things are. Every death is a tragedy. And the community campaign groups that Mr. Ruskell highlights in his motion should be commended for the hard work that they do to promote safety on Scotland's roads. He points in particular to 20 mile per hour speed zones and to campaign groups such as 20s Plenty. Now in Edinburgh, of course, we are live to this particular debate with the rollout plan currently being implemented across the city, intended eventually to result in 80% of Edinburgh's roads adopting the 20 mile per hour limit by the end of January 2018. Phase one started over this past summer period and as well as covering roads directly outside this building, it extends well beyond the city centre towards more rural communities such as Curry, Balerno and Ratho. As has been pointed out by my colleague Alex Johnston, however, simply lowering speed limits is not enough. Now, I am aware of concerns that have been raised already at local level about enforcement of the new 20 mile per hour limit in the apparent absence of adherence to higher speed limits on arterial routes. So the one should not go without the other. Now all options should of course be considered when it comes to possible actions which may improve road safety. However, I am not certain that a blanket 20 mile per hour policy in Scotland's urban city areas should be accepted without question. In addition to the concern about lack of adherence to higher speed limits and the questions about enforcement, there's also the question of the effect of a blanket urban 20 mile per hour policy on driver concentration, for example. Clearly, there are areas within residential and urban zones where 20 miles per hour is the appropriate speed limit. Indeed, we have had these zones around schools uh, in many cases for many years, and I think few would argue against that. The desired effects are reached by, if I might continue. The member's in his last minute. Yes. The desired effects reached by concentrating both the driver's attention as well as police resources in specific areas can eliminate significant risk to certain groups of people. 
whereas a blanket rollout may have the effect of diverting the attention of the driver away from the significance of adopting slower speeds in areas such as around schools. In Edinburgh, we also risk grinding the traffic of the capital city of Scotland to a halt, with resultant twin effects of increased congestion and increased pollution. This is good neither for business, the economy, nor the environment. May I say if you stop right then, that's a good place to stop. <laughs> uh, I will do that's so. That's a deputy. recommendation. I will do so, Deputy Thank Presiding you. Officer. Thank you. Uh, I now call on Alison Johnson, the last speaker of the open debate, followed by the Minister. Ms Johnson, four minutes, please. Uh, thank you very much, Deputy Presiding Officer. I'd like to begin by congratulating my Green colleague, Mark Ruskell, on bringing this issue to the Chamber this evening. Um, I will admit at once that I too remember the Tufty Club, and that also made me think about the Green Cross Code Man. Um, but perhaps the Minister can consult YouTube after the debate and learn more. I think one important thing to consider while we're discussing this issue is who are our cities for? Who are the streets for? I think um, very often we consider the motorist, which is obviously quite right, but we have to think about streets as a shared space and a space, uh, you know, along the sides of which we all live. And I think there's a real opportunity here to address the way we use them and make them more accessible to more people. We all know streets where Currently, the speed limit is 30 miles per hour, and for that reason, parents are very cautious about letting their children out to play, because while it's 30, there's every chance that a car will come belting round the corner at that 30, which will just catch out someone who's not quite ready for that speed on that otherwise very quiet residential road. So I think there is a real opportunity here to ensure that more people in Scotland have more access to streets. and. While we're speaking about the progress that is very welcome in Edinburgh and um, has been led in part by Green Councillor colleagues just up the road, I'd also like to highlight the Play Out initiative, where streets on certain days in the capital have been closed to cars. Um, uh, one that I'll mention is Abbotsford Crescent. I attended it. They had a day. It was called Play Out. And this is a through road um, up near Brunsfield, and both ends of the street were cordoned off. They had a couple of barriers, the, the police were involved, they consulted with residents, and the impact of that one street being close to cars on that day was quite remarkable. Neighbours were out, and it wasn't just children, they, they commented themselves, it was everyone, who, you know, from, from two-year-olds to eight-year-olds, the atmosphere changed, and actually I was speaking to one of those people today, and that's something that they want to see rolled out. They want that to become a more frequent occurrence, because, let's face it, a lot of our streets are quite quiet on a Sunday. But I do think this move to a slower, more considered traffic speed is something that we should welcome. We're asking that the government rolls out on-road cycle training for all. Now that's fine while your child is out with a professional trainer and they're getting the input and the experience that they need. But many parents simply would not allow their children to cycle on the road unattended in current circumstances. I think there are many groups here that we owe um, our thanks to in pushing this agenda forward. Living Streets, Sustrans, Twenties Plenty and, and cycling organisations like Spokes too. We know that in some roads in this very city on workday mornings, you know, 20% of vehicles coming down our main arterial routes are bicycles. And I think that could be increased massively. And you know, in this very city, Professor David Newby at the Royal Infirmary has been doing fabulous work highlighting the links between air pollution and heart disease. You're highly likely to have been sitting in busy traffic in the hours before you have a major heart incident. So these are things that we have to take very seriously indeed. Um, Claire Adamson's expertise in this area, you know, she's pointed out that reducing speed reduces casualties. This is something that we have to take very seriously. I think there are so many opportunities and benefits if we focus on this agenda. The, the benefits are indisputable, I would argue, if we flip 30 to 20. And I would ask the government to use all the powers it has in working with our local authority partners across Scotland to pursue this agenda. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much, Ms Johnson. I call uh, Hamza Yusuf to close the government. Seven minutes, Minister, please. Thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. Uh, lowering uh, speed is, is, is a crucial component in reducing risk uh, on our roads, and for that reason, uh, I very much congratulate Mark Ruskell 
uh, for securing this member's debate. I thank the members from uh, across the chamber. We made some very uh, nuanced points, but also, uh, uh, of course, presented some challenges that they threw uh, across the chamber towards the government, and ones that, uh, of course, I will reflect on uh, as the Minister for, for Transport. Uh, I thought members spoke very passionately and consistently, actually, about the correlation between speed and casualties. I think that's uh, well established. I think it's almost uh, indisputable now uh, because of the uh, weight of evidence uh, that it exists. Um, on top of that, uh, the climate and uh, the reduction of CO2 uh, emissions um, was also mentioned by a few members uh, as well. As discussed at the UK Climate Change Committee last week, vehicle speeds uh, directly impact uh, on emissions and community health and can help uh, promote uh, active travel. Uh, I want to take this opportunity, uh, if I can, uh, presiding officer, to highlight some of the activity that the Scottish Government is doing and undertaking to help to ensure speeds are lowered uh, on our roads. Uh, I have to confess, I have never heard of the Tufty Club. I will go on Google uh, after this. It's a shame because uh, I thought with the uh, introduction of uh, Ross Greer to this parliament and Kate Forbes, that frankly I was the elder statesman, but clearly uh, not uh, the case. But uh, what we have produced in, in, in government is uh, Scotland's road safety framework to 2020. It was a document that was referred to or alluded to uh, by a number uh, of members where we set out a vision where there's no fatalities on Scotland's roads. And while this remains an ambitious target, I know I want to live in a Scotland where that uh, ambition is realised. Underpinning that vision are challenging casualty reduction targets. And again, they've been alluded to uh, by some members, but if I might just point out some of the specifics, uh, fatalities reduced by 44%. Uh, that's from a 2004 uh, eight baseline. Um, but with 162 people killed on our roads in 2015, uh, there's no room for complacency. Members have said it, and I will say it and repeat it and reiterate it, that uh, one child uh, or one person killed on our roads is one person uh, too many. Uh, I thought Claire Adamson was very uh, brave, and, and, and I appreciate the fact that she shared her own personal story and her own personal loss uh, with her niece uh, eight years ago. But it was an important reminder to us that behind these statistics is a human life, and behind those human lives are uh, families that are... Uh, absolutely devastated by the impact, of course, uh, of these fatalities. Uh, the framework uh, also outlines 96 commitments, uh, which include measures to highlight the benefits of driving at lower speeds uh, in relation to road safety, health impacts, fuel efficiency, uh, creating a space more equally shared, as Alison Johnson just spoke about, and encouraging more active travel choices. I won't, of course, go through uh, all 96 commitments in, at all, but I would uh, recommend that uh, members and those members of the public that have an interest uh, in this uh, read uh, perhaps and flick their way through uh, that important document. Uh, also, within this, there's a clear commitment to encourage local authorities to introduce 20 mile per hour zones uh, or limits in, in residential uh, areas. And that uh, perhaps is the crux uh, of, of, of Mark Ruskell's uh, conversation and, and, and uh, I think intention to bring this debate to, to the parliament. That uh, this debate that we're having, I think Jenny Mara touched upon it, and alluded to it in the example she gave of Johnson Avenue. Um, you know, do, we, uh, do we go for the, the blanket approach, which the government is not, uh, uh, at the moment, convinced uh, in doing because of the consultations we've taken with local authorities? Uh, they prefer that uh, they have the discretion of where uh, to roll out 20 mile an hour zones. And the uptake of that has been fairly good, as I've mentioned, and, uh, and has been mentioned. Uh, Edinburgh City Council uh, certainly leading uh, the way. Of course, I'll, I'll give way to... Mr. Roscoe. Would you not acknowledge, though, that the TRO process is very complex and burdensome on local authorities, and that it may be simpler just to say to local authorities, well, you decide where you want the main 30-mile-an-hour arterial route, routes and actually exempt those from a default 20-mile-an-hour limits rather than trying to create endless networks of 20-mile-an-hour zones that are very costly and time-consuming to put in place? I think the Edinburgh example is a good one, actually. I mean, the Edinburgh example, and I'm, I'm happy to, to take this further and speak to city council officials, but the Edinburgh example actually is one where uh, it doesn't seem to have been as cumbersome as perhaps the member uh, is suggesting. I will reflect on the, the, the TRO uh, scheme, of course, uh, look to see where we can make it easier, we can make it less cumbersome. cumbersome. But the feedback from the local authorities was they want to have the discretion. I'm not always saying that they have got it, always got it right, and they'll always get it right in the same way I'm sure we would appreciate that uh, government doesn't always get things right uh, either. Um, but I think having it in the hands of local authorities who should know their local communities better 
uh, is a better approach. And I would like to say I think it's, it's, it's working. I mean, as I say, Edinburgh is taking the lead, but they're certainly not at all by any stretch of the imagination the only ones who are driving forward uh, or moving forward perhaps better this uh, agenda. We know that uh, Glasgow City Council introduced a city-wide centre 20 mile per hour zone uh, from March, 21st of March 2016. Dundee City Council's consultation has already been mentioned uh, by uh, Jenny Maran. Of course, uh, great advances being made by Fife uh, as well, where the member uh, has uh, an interest uh, as well. Of course. Ms Mara. Thank the Minister for giving way. Would he, does he think that all roads with access to a school should be 20 miles per hour? Minister. Again, it's for the local authorities to, and it's their discretion to make that decision. But yes, uh, we certainly are encouraging local authorities for those areas that have a residential zone, for those, uh, in the residential zone, those that are near schools, then we think, yes, of course, it's sensible for them to, to, to enact a 20 mile per hour zone, but it must be up to the discretion of the uh, local authority. But I want to come back to the point of Johnson Avenue, which uh, uh, Miss Mara uh, wrote to me about, and which I answered, and of course uh, I will in the future, uh, as, as, as time and diary allows, uh, visit uh, that particular street and also meet with uh, the members, uh, residents of that street. Uh, but to me, uh, again, the local authority, I don't know the ins and the outs. I, my assumption would be the local authority would know that area better than anybody else. Uh, and indeed, in consultation with the residents, uh, would look to, to, to put in, forward the, the appropriate measures. What I will do in the back of what she said, because she gave a more detailed description uh, of that street, uh, what I will do in my next conversation with Dundee City Council, find out what is going on, what the thinking is, and I'm happy to, to report back uh, to, to Jenny Mann. I know I'm at the end, uh, presiding officer, uh, of um, my, uh, my, my allotted time. Uh, safe to say that uh, uh, we see this in the Scottish Government, very proud of the progress that's been made in 20 mile per hour zones. I thank Mark Ruskell for bringing this debate uh, to the Chamber. I'm more than happy to have a further conversation with him about some of the complexities in the current system that he's spoken about. Um, and happy to take other, any other suggestions because, as I say, at the heart of this is safety for uh, the people of Scotland. And in particular, if I can say, for children uh, in Scotland as well. So if we can make our roads safer, I'm open-minded to any plans that can help us to achieve that. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you. That concludes the debate. I now close this meeting of Parliament.